All right, uh, so welcome to Home Screens. Uh, thanks for coming. So what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm, I'm Christopher Cox. I'm going to be moderating this panel. And so what I'll do is I'll just uh, introduce each individual panelist uh, just before they present, rather than doing a collective introduction um, at, here at the beginning. So uh, what we're going to do is kick it off with Jessica Tremblay. Uh, Jessica is a PhD candidate in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Toronto, Canada. Her research interests are infrastructure, digital anthropology, ICT4D, internet and social media use in Indonesia, and urban anthropology. Jessica. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming, and hi to my friends in Indo Indonesia who might be watching. Um, I'm just going to jump right in. I'm going to be talking about the research that I did for my PhD dissertation. Um, I did a research project in Yogyakarta, which is a city in central Java in Indonesia. It's a small urban neighborhood uh, of about 150 people, um, which had become famous for connecting almost all of its residents to high-speed internet without government support. Uh, the neighborhood was called Kampung Cyber. which means cyber village or cyber neighborhood. And what I wanted to find out for this research was how do residents use the internet to advance the socioeconomic development of their neighborhood. Now when they started their, uh, their initiative in 2008, Indonesia had an internet penetration rate of about 10%, which is about 25 million users. And by 2010, Kampung Cyber claimed that about 92% of its homes were connected, which was a pretty big deal at the time. Since that time, local and national media have become quite enamored with the neighborhood because it seemed to have used the internet to recover uh, from, the Indo uh, sorry, from the Asian financial crisis from, of 1997. This is just a map of the neighborhood, and you can see here, um, you know, where the the Internet Explorer uh, Internet Explorer logos next to the houses, just to indicate which houses were connected at the time. So by the time I arrived in Kampung Cyber, the neighborhood was popularized as a model community for keeping its traditional Javanese values, um, at the same time as it embraced modern internet te technology. I did 20 months of ethnography in this neighborhood between 2012 and 2014, um, and I found that the internet did play a major role uh, in Kampung Cyber's development, but it wasn't so much because it provided residents with direct online business opportunities. Um, I'd like to argue that the aesthetic and the semiotic dimensions of the internet play as much of a political and economic role in the lives, in the lives of its residents as do its wires and its cables. And I'm going to do that by drawing on theory from the anthropology of infrastructure. As an anthropologist, I pay attention to how infrastructure interacts with culture and society. For Brian Larkin, infrastructures are built networks that facilitate the flow of goods, people, or ideas, and allow for their exchange over space. Now, infrastructures work at several levels at the same time. They are functional. Um, they're functional because they enable the circulation of goods, of people, or ideas, um, but we can also separate the form from the function. Um, the form from the function in order, um, because we can make other types of insights that might be lost to a purely technical approach. Now, infrastructures often become signs and symbols because of how they make us feel about the world around us. It's this multi-layeredness that makes infrastructures such productive objects of ethnographic or anthropological inquiry. Uh, now, specifically in Indonesia, people started gaining access to the internet in the late 1990s, near the end of uh, Suharto's autocratic regime. Um, so for about, from 1997 to 2008, uh, they accessed internet mostly through internet cafes known, as, known, as, known locally as Warnet. Uh, now, more recently, mobile phones have started replacing these internet cafes as the most popular source for internet access. And Kampung Cyber sort of emerged at the nexus of this shift from um, warnet use to mobile technology. Uh, Kampung Cyber is a neighborhood that came up with a 
pretty simple way to connect its residents to the internet. In 2008, they made a deal with their local telecom company to set up a system of shared networks connected throughout the neighborhood and they would use their own cable and materials to do so because it was cheaper to do it that way. So each household would pay about four US dollars per month for unlimited internet access compared to the usual um, 15 to 20 dollars per month uh, for other individual connections. And this made a huge difference for local residents because most people use, tend to make between 100, 150 or 300 dollars per month at the time. So internet access in the neighborhood rose quite dramatically. It went from only one or two household connections in the neighborhood to about 23 uh, in 2000, uh, 2010. And of the 24 households that I surveyed in 2013, only four didn't actually have one computer or a tablet. And only five of the 47 adults that I surveyed um, didn't use the internet in Kampung Cyber. So about eight households have adopted online business uh, as at least part of their total income generation methods. Um, these are just pictures of examples of the types of businesses that were taking place online. So uh, on the top left, we had uh, a resident who came up with a business of creating um, uh, special effects makeup for film and selling this stuff like false beards and mustaches through um, online networks. Uh, we had residents who would sell batik, art and curio online. Some people would even um, sell uh, food items like fried chicken, and one family was quite, uh, quite well known for their fishing store. Um, it's important to note that most families in this neighborhood didn't actually use the internet to, um, to make a living. Uh, most of them would have um, you know, home-based ba home businesses like selling snacks or catering or doing laundry service. Uh, and some families were lucky enough to have more stable income from things like teaching or hotel, ma hotel management, but these opportunities were rarer. So I'm just going to jump into the argument then. Um, I'm saying that Kampung Cyber is part of an increase in the appearance of what I call Internet Kampung. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain Kampung in just a minute. An internet kampung is an Indonesian version of a community-based internet saturation point. And we can define this very broadly as a geographically bounded and community-oriented internet network. So uh, CBISPs typically aim to achieve higher than average levels uh, of internet connectivity within residential neighborhoods, and the point is to improve socioeconomic conditions. And they can be initiated by any, a variety of uh, groups, like uh, at the grassroots level, they can be non-governmental, um, they can be corporate, or they can be government entities. What's particular about um, these networks in Indonesia is that they're based in Kampung. Kampung are infor informal settlements that are composed usually of lower class residents who live in densely packed, um, lower quality homes, sometimes middle class as well, uh, and they're often in the, in the margins of urban areas. Uh, kampung are cultural, also have a cultural connotation. So people who live in them uh, tend to idealize banding together to share resources and support each other in difficult urban conditions. And they also have nostalgic ties uh, to the ideals of rural village life. So about 60 to 70% of residents in Indonesian cities have lived in Kampung. Now I've observed or traced at least five examples of internet Kampung in Indonesia, apart from Kampung Cyber. Uh, this is a neighborhood very close to Kampung Cyber that was a government telecom pilot project that set up about 25, uh, 29 Wi-Fi hotspots um, in the neighborhood so that residents could access internet for 24 hours for only 10 cents. This is a, another neighborhood that was very close to Kampung Cyber as well and basically copied Kampung Cyber's uh, model of connecting residents to the internet for a low cost. There were other neighborhoods in other cities as well, such as Wirengan uh, Internet Community in the city of Solo uh, and Kampung Blogger, which is located in, in Magalang, also in central Java. Kampung Cyber itself stood out because it branded the neighborhood to get more attention from the media. And the point was to leverage the neighborhood's cultural capital through the media to expand its economic and social opportunities. The houses and fences in Kampung Cyber were painted with colorful murals that depicted scenes of traditional Javanese life mixed with images associated with high-tech modernity. 
In this particular image, Mark Zuckerberg gives a thumbs up in a scene that's filled with symbols of tradition and modernity, including characters that are dressed in traditional Javanese attire and navigating social media. Uh, and there's also a famous uh, traditional Javanese shadow puppet character floating above the scene while holding up a selfie stick. So the community um, also produced uh, items featuring the Kampung Cyber logo, like these, there are DVDs, mugs, t-shirts, there are signs all over the neighborhood. So basically Kampung Cyber um, has involved fetishizing the internet as a symbol representing the community's imagined Javaneseness, uh, which has been syncretized with its commitment to modern technology. This is an, imi uh, an image that uh, neighborhood residents really appreciate. So comp uh, Mark Zuckerberg sort of showed up in the neighborhood uh, just a month or two after I left uh, for my field work. Uh, and he sort of, you know, he, he did a tour of the neighborhood um, and basically promised residents that he'd, you know, he'd be there to assist them with any kind of, um, you know, help that they needed. So basically, Kampung Cyber's branding of itself kind of led to indirect benefits. So you had people like Mark Zuckerberg showing up. Um, but the neighborhood residents were also involved in um, sort of advertising around Indonesia uh, about their projects. So um, they'd have students and academics coming from all over Indonesia, and they would give presentations about their story of how they came about, uh, how they set themselves up, with the idea that the students would kind of uh, take those ideas and then bring them uh, and show people people in their own neighbor neighborhoods how to create their own Kampung Cyber. Um, I've sort of run out of time, so I'm not going to go into more detail about that, but I'm happy to answer more questions about the main argument that I have. So thanks for your time. Okay, uh, thanks Jessica. And so next up, Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So next up, well, we have uh, Diana Buendia. Uh, she lives in Los Angeles, and through her work, she explores the hegemonic tensions between the U.S. and Latin America, and the way related narratives reflect back through media. Diana. Be able to see it, but that's okay. Okay. This is high. <clears throat> okay, so I titled this paper Soothing the Pain of Rupture in the Mist of Messaging Apps, but in the middle of writing it, I wondered if I should have called it Perpetuating Neo Colonial Cycles of Violence via Messaging Apps and bark on more of a pointed critique of how social and class hierarchies in Ecuador are perpetuated via technology as I sit here and watch from afar. My initial focus on soothing this pain, though, is telling, it, is telling in that it shows that my priority is to invoke a trope of displacement, of what it feels to leave not just the place, but the psychological construct of home, and to learn to put a name on violent hierarchies that have shaped so-called modernity in the Americas for the past 500 years, myself included. To remain aware of the violent commonalities between the place I left and the place where I live now, to see indicators of that shared and reshared via technology, via a private messaging app, seems to mostly exacerbate my own feelings of being at an impasse, in Lauren Berlant's words, a, st a stretch of time in which one moves around with a sense that the world is at once intensely present and enigmatic, such that the activity of living demands both a wandering, absurdive awareness and a hypervigilance that collects material that might help to clarify things. So more than a critique of people's behaviors is the probing of my own circumstances and desires a manifestation of this collection of material as I continue to want to have a sense of something. So what has been difficult to acknowledge is that had I initially known about the insidiousness of the concept of Americanity, as identified by Peruvian and US sociologists Aníbal Quijano and Emmanuel Wallerstein, I probably wouldn't have moved to the US. 
Quijano and Wallerstein define Americanity as a foundational element of modernity in which coloniality, racism, ethnicity, and the very concept of newness were constitutive of the Americas, both North and South, from the very start. So why didn't I just deal with the insidiousness of the America I already knew? There's nothing casual about my idealizing of US culture and wanting to move here, though, since Americanity did take a very different shape for both regions. As historicized colonial projects, it appears that the Spanish got bogged down by church, religious wars, dynastic prestige, and concerns with seniorial status, Quijano and Wallerstein explain, largely failing at creating hegemonic social forces that could preserve a political unity. The British colonizers here instead were laser focused on building a capitalist Euro European society of white men on American soil. They exterminated the indigenous peoples, imported slave labor, and treated everything and everyone like a commodity in order to ensure national development. So different iter iterations with the same foundation, but I had been aggressively sold the product of the latter. Inside a gated community in Guayaquil, Ecuador, where I grew up, I went to a private school where I got a US high school diploma and learned nothing about my own country's history, just textbook US history in a class taught by a teacher from Waco, Texas, who hung a Confederate flag from the ceiling. At that moment, the severity of it all was lost on me. I only continued to internalize that collective will that Lauren Berlant describes to imagine myself as a solitary agent who can and must live the good life promised by capitalist culture in the US. I was deceived by the propaganda of the US as a meritocracy, the sense that liberal capitalist society will reliably provide opportunities to individuals to carve out relations of reciprocity that seem fair. The city where I'm from always represents to me the opposite. Arlene Davila confirms in El Mol her thorough study of class dynamics in the growing neoliberal urban developments in Latin American cities that in some cases, people from the higher class echelons continue to insist that class is only inherited and embodied, rendering the possibility of upward mobility fake. So hyper aware of social hierarchies, I left. That fantasy of the meritocracy did not last long, and because this is not the time to get into the many failures of that facade, let's just say that here I've been unable to contort myself enough to comfortably fit inside the cold, ethnocentric borders of this country. My own continuity in this world became jumbled once I became aware of Americanity at work, while at the same time feeling limited by this country that stubbornly continues to be defined by its internal social relations with its borders anything but fluid and contested, as scholar Amy Kaplan writes. So not knowing how to exist in this, I've developed a Berlantian attachment to a city I once left because of its oppressiveness, invested in my own world's continuity in order to make sense of it all. Okay, so what happens is I receive messages from Ecuador daily on WhatsApp, particularly via group chats. If you're not familiar, WhatsApp is a messaging app owned by Facebook now that has over one billion users worldwide. It was built on the premise of using your phone's contacts folder as a pre-built social network. One of the po more popular WhatsApp features is the group chats, especially because as long as you have access to Wi-Fi, you are connected to the app, which facilitates cohesiveness between Android and Apple users around the world. So currently, my 59-year-old mother has 35 group chats made, uh, made up of anything from high school friends, childhood friends, close family, extended family, Catholic friends. In comparison, my 20-year-old sister belongs to 15 group chats. If, like Davila describes, we think of malls as privately owned public spaces where people learn and perform class and of the proliferation of gated communities in growing Latin American cities as linked to long-standing colonial and neocolonial hierarchies of race, class and region and patterns of segregation, then what about the dynamics of a popular messaging app that serves as a pre-built social media network made up of mostly people in your own class strata in a digital space that media theorist Wendy Hu Kyung Chun describes as increasingly resembling gating, great gated communities, enclosed open spaces of neoliberal subjects always searching and never finding. The memes that are shared on WhatsApp are telling. Some depend on that speculative connotation of hashtag relatability that writer Arya Dean has described, while others speak to the country's tumultuous politics. 
The Meryl Streep app recently popularized um, that was going around the internet like maybe two weeks ago, it was circulating via WhatsApp, via Ecuadorian WhatsApp over a year ago, mostly adorned with ornate insults directed at the government. Others are particularly insidious, obviously racist and misogyny. So here I'm going to show some images, and they're a bit offensive, but that's the point, so I apologize. <clears throat> There's one, this one's are specifically built for WhatsApp. An image shared is of a car stuck in heavy rain as if you're transmitting news of something happening in the area. You only see the car when it's in the chat feed, but once the image is expanded, the joke is that the photo is framed by a black man showing his black penis. The same image was circulated during last weekend's election. At first glance, it's a picture of the ballot marked in favor of the left-wing candidate. The picture expanded shows the same man and it's meant to disgust you. You voted for the wrong guy, so joke's on you. This is one example, and I don't, I don't have time for more, but the fact that these memes are shared quickly, confidently, in group chats of middle and upper class WhatsApp users in Ecuador is what I can point to to argue that they are grounded in the same classist and racist notions of respectability and has enhanced by real neoliberalism that make life in some Latin American cities suffocating. Of course, there are other ways in which this app is used. Primarily consider that one of the most public altercations of the current Ecuadorian president, the, the, one of the most public altercations he's had has been with a meme maker who ridiculed him. So a turn towards the private spheres of WhatsApp avoids the official policing of anti-government rhetoric. So Arlene Davila writes that one of the lessons that emerged for her from her study of shopping mall culture in Latin America was the reality of people's constant public and social evaluation of themselves and others. Individuals are still individuals on group chats on the internet. Hugh Kyun Chun writes, never creating a communal subject, a community. What do you perform for those who belong to your own class when the punchline of your joke are those outside of your group? The, the hierarchy is my, maintained through ridicule. There's a distance that's afforded to me by reading ethnographic studies like Davila's, studies that confirm through rigorous academic methods what I've known. And even if at the impasse that I'm in, it's important to acknowledge Berlant's point that to be at an impasse could even be an aspiration or privilege as things are crumbling at a threatening pace. What am I ultimately getting at collecting this material from afar when the reality of segregation in class structures results in material consequences with those who deal with it at a local level? What do you, enact to, what do, you do to enact change in a pattern of behavior that has been at play for the past 500 years? So going back to the concept of Americanity, the popular narrative that frames life in the US in pursuit of a supposed merit-based system still sold as the American dream, whether forced or by choice, versus the provinciality of life in the third world, obfuscates a larger probing into why we're here in the first place. So the drive behind modernization and the new world was a call for scientific rationality and popular sovereignty, but it must be clear that the Iberian and English colonists denied these very same foundational ideas through their practices and technologies of genocide, racism, social classification, and labor control. To uphold these Eurocentric models is to continue to wear blinders while running in circles. And I have to repeat that to myself to make up for the years that the opposite was sold to me. At this point, my own attachment to knowing how things work in my own country by keeping those insistent messages on via WhatsApp while feeling despondent in this country has mostly resulted in an intens intensified loneliness and detachment from the concept of home. My own world's continuity now depends on probing the interconnectedness of the Americas in order to figure out where we go from here. And you could say I've developed a different attachment contemporaneously to the task of collectively understanding and transforming Americanity from a shared violent capitalist project to a system that exalts social solidarity and reciprocity, as Quijano and Wallerstein point to optimistically. Berlant writes of attachments as optimistic, but says that they might feel any number of ways. So I'm okay with knowing that this particular one feels kind of impossible. Thank you.
Okay, uh, thank you, Deanna. And so next up, we have Ted Perlmutter. Uh, Ted is an adjunct associate professor in global affairs at New York University and a visiting lecturer of sociology at Columbia University. He teaches a course on social media, conflict, and forced migration. Ted? Um. Well, actually, I um, in many ways, the, mo the more relevant part of my identity here is that I spent um, a better part of 10 years doing work um, related to and sometimes in Iraq. Um, and I was there in 2004, um, working actually on refugees and, and IDP issues, basically trying to figure out how to get the 800,000 Kurds who'd been kicked out of Kirkuk back in there. And that's sort of where I got this, started thinking about connectivity. Um, sort of connectivity found and connectivity lost, and of course this question of borders. So um, just to sort of give you guys something to think about, um, what I'd like to sort of propose just at the beginning is to think about the moment at which you understood how the internet constructed your connectivity, and then think also about the moments at which you felt most lost without your connectivity. Um, in my case, the connectivity lesson of, of Iraq was I realized that the only thing that actually worked there was ba things based upon satellites. So you had sat phones that worked, you had um, internet cafes based on satellites, and of course you had satellite television so you could watch reruns of ALF from the 1980s in German if that was your desire. Um, the moment of being lost was when I was actually trying to get back from Iraq into Turkey and discovered that I was there at the mercy of Turkish border guards because one of my friends had brought back a map of Greater Kurdistan, which took about a third of Turkey, and they were not very happy with that. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll leave the, you know, the final point about borders uh, for the end. But anyway, what I want to talk about today is precisely the sort of question you know, sort of, of refugees, and particularly the question of whether refugees uh, can be thought of in terms of of precarity, um, because one of the obvious things about refugee, you know, the most recent Syrian refugee case is that it's been fundamentally transformed by the, the sort of the use and the availability of cell phones. Um, now, this utility doesn't stop these phones from being sort of seen as an object of consternation. Um, a couple of years ago, there was this sort of debate within the newspapers about, you know, are these really refugees because they have all these fancy cell phones, right? So, you know, if you have one of these, you can't possibly be a refugee. Um, and, you know, pr precisely because refugees are, are defined in terms of being, you know, needy, and, and again, despite the fact that 95% of the people in Syrians actually had some kind of phones. And the second concern about it was it raised securitization issues. There was this image of, you know, again, sort of cell phone wielding refugees contesting the police and, and the, I guess, in Calais. Um, and again, despite the fact that if you actually, you know, read what Zainab Tufekti and others talk about, uh, you know, phones are absolutely necessary for any kind of ambient awareness in contested space. So, theoretically, what, you know, what type of, you know, of, of an object is this? So, I'll be slightly less theoretical than, than most here and just sort of, you know, talk briefly about the kind of the natures of the social affordance. Um, so obviously communications and networking, we'll talk initially about, uh, you know, sort of navigation and locatability and then the most important discourse I think will be on the sort of the multimedia uh, affordances. So this is sort of your, your image of uh, refugees going from Turkey, landing in Greece. Um, now, the second thing that they always ask for is Wi-Fi connectivity. First is dry clothes, but... Um, and in fact, I, if I had you know, confidence in, in any sort of multimedia or internet capacity, I would have showed you uh, a short clip of somebody preparing for their journey and very nicely placing their phone inside a plastic sack and saying, or something plastic around their neck and saying, well, you know, if the ship goes down, at least I'll have my cell phone. And, you know, and obviously, you know, in some cases, locability is a matter of sort of, you know, sort of you know, life and death in terms of your ability to kind of navigate your journey. 
Um, so I mean, you know, this is sort of a case of you know what happened when the boat goes does go down and how you get to safety. Um, so, but as, as I started to think about this question of refugees and precarity, I realized there's sort of four instances. One is the voyage, which I've talked about. The second is this con sort of refugee camps, and the third is this question of non-encamp persons, which are increasingly, you know, a large percentage of folks, and particularly in the countries that sort of interest me, which are sort of Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey. And then the final question is sort of integration, which um, is another talk. Um, so, I mean, and I, the themes that I want to go through very quickly are sort of, you know, protection, pr you know, sort of the making a living in a precarious job market, which is sort of where the, the broader precarity discourse comes from, thinking briefly about surveillance, and finally telling your story. So, you know, basically information precarity, which is what dominates the camps, is in which basically you don't have the access to the news and information that you need. Uh, again, the sort of specificity of the camps is that you have this set of issues, um, the last three probably being the most interesting and the most gener generalizable. Uh, now, everybody in the United States takes, you know, takes uh, these issues very seriously. There was this big riot in Greece, um, but they let the, you know, the, the NetHope inter guys uh, through to make sure that they got their Wi-Fi to work. I hate to make uh, so, but what's interesting um, from the standpoint of thinking about the logic of precarity are refugees outside of camps. Um, I mean, you can sort of see this limbo in Europe, but you can see it primarily almost anywhere in, in the Middle East um, because there's simply so little full protection. Um, but none of these countries actually ever signed the refugee accords, so people come in under very hazy and very difficult statuses from which it's very easy to fall out. I mean, once you fall out of these status, you're obviously not only have economic risk at hand, but you have all these kind of political slash, you know, uh, deportation risks. There's a lot of uh, sort of academic literature on this, thinking primarily in terms of this overall concept. And it's, I mean, I actually couldn't find any good studies in, uh, in, uh, in the Arab world on this, so I had to go to the, you know, sort of one of the closer places that I could find, which was Naples. Um, which in which people there is actually some good anthropology talking about the ways in which this is sort of an object of overall ontological security, but specifically, you know, a way of dealing with the kind of existential, juridical, and political insecurities that you face. Um, and so the first thing is that I want to talk about, you know, is this issue kind of a, of protection? And again, you sort of see this both within the UNHCR context. Um, we're, 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 you know, where they will mention this, and then again, our sort of our friend in Naples, who's trying to make a, you know, while he's waiting for his refugee claim to be processed, is trying to make a living by selling, you know, sort of DVDs and various things, but discovering that, you know, this is a very tricky process, and you really sort of, you know, need access, you need knowledge, you need networks. Or as the Neapolitans put it, l'arte di arrangiarsi. Um, so, you know, this basically en enables folks to sort of figure out, you know, uh, how to avoid the police, how to avoid the Camorra or the Mafia, and how to sort of, you know, make sure you, you get your transactions made. Now, the challenge of the cell phone is it's also, and I don't really have time to go into this, sort of an object of surveillance. So, um, um, so, so you know, if, you, if you were actually tr you know, trying to go from, for example, from Assyria into Lebanon, you know, basically the guards will demand their cell phones. They can actually do this to you in the, to you in the U.S. at this point as well. So be very careful if you're crossing a boundary with, you're trying to get back into the country with information you don't want uh, the state to see. Um, so people end up tossing, you know, their phones, and you also see this in terms of internal checkpoints and really broader concerns within these kinds of refugee camps. Um, and but the the interesting part of this. Um, I think is, you know, what, um, you know, you can use cell phones to do in terms of sort of telling your story, both, as I said, as a kind of a form of empowerment, and then as a way of sort of thinking about the kind of broader discursive possibilities within, you know, you know sort of within the U.S. So Trump is, you know, for example, Donald Trump is very happy to, you know, uh, bomb an airport, 
in defense of you know, uh, Syrian children who've been, you know, been gassed, but rather unlikely to actually let them come into the country. So the argument becomes, in other words, how can you use the kinds of stories that people can tell, um, have them, you know, sort of developed and amplified by, by others, and, you know, make a broader claim about, you know, what it means to be a refugee and why refugees should have rights. Um, because, I mean, there, you know, there's this argument, you know, with coming again from the anthropologist about this nature of speechlessness, i.e. that if you're in these particular kinds of camps, you know, you don't really have a voice and your voice is dominated by others. So the question then becomes, well, you know, how can you, in some more artful way, develop these kinds of voices? Um, and here's where we get into this very tricky question of the peculiarities of being, you know, what it means to be a refugee, because um, in many ways, unlike, you know, legal or illegal migrants of, of other forms, refugees are, are just sort of defined as victims with rights, in fact, they have rights because you know, they can make a claim to a certain kind of you know, victimhood. But this becomes slightly tricky when you start to think about, well, how does this relate to advocacy and how does this relate to these kind of broader issues of precarity? Um, and here you sort of get to you know, a kind of a more European, a more Marxist argument, you know, what, what Marx at one point called radical chains, of thinking about precarity as a way of mobilizing, and as a way of making claims upon the state. And you know, the, the question I'd sort of like to leave people with is you know, sort of what is this relationship between the kinds of claims that refugees and, forced, and other kinds of forced migrants can make in combination with other people who are you know, here under some kind of unauthorized status, and then even presumably more broadly uh, with other folks in the world. Um, but this really comes down to this question of, you know, how does a refugee differ from, you know, an illegal or undocumented migrant? Um, how does the, the, the nature of their claims correspond with and can, how can they build upon thinking about this in terms of a broader language of precarity and thus solidarity at the end? I right, leave you my 15 seconds. All right, uh, thank you, Ted. Uh, so we've got one more presentation, uh, and then uh, directly after this final presentation, we'll open it up to some Q&A. Uh, so taking us home is going to be Shane Tilton, who is an assistant professor at Ohio Northern University, and Kenneth Harwood Dissertation Award winner, who also happens to be an academic hobo, slash polymath, slash bon vivant, slash doctor of philosophy. Shane? So good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Chris said, I'm Shane Tilton. And what I want to talk today is two issues that seem to be coming into relevance in the, the modern mindset. One is the role of journalism in a modern society, and the second is the, the culture and the significance of Appalachia and its relationship to the United States. To talk about Appalachia, we have to explain it in three different ideas. The first is the geographic. For those that are not familiar with the Appalachian region of the United States, it is of the boundaries of the Appalachian Mountains, which gives it a, a, a geographic sense of resources and, and beauty throughout the course of the mountains. Number two is the cultural traditions of the Appalachian region. Primarily we talk about in terms of music and cultural signifiers and sort of the, the modified representations of those that live and work in the region. The third is the current issues that the region is dealing with, primarily the, the, the sense of poverty and the, the use of dr and drug addiction within the region itself. The reason this became a more significant area, and this came from a discussion that Donald Taylor and I had a couple years ago about what was starting to spring up in, in the press, was sort of this revitalization of the Appalachian region as a focal point. And this became especially more coherent this year with the presidential primaries and two points of, of natural disaster, specifically the West Virginia floods that were happened in the early part of the summer and the Gatlinburg uh, wildfires near Tennessee. So with this focus in mind, 
we started to see the presidential election come up, and what we started to hear as a consistent narrative and discourse in the in the in the media is the sense that the media was unprepared for sort of the support that Donald Trump received, um, specifically at the primary levels and towards the general election, and. This support was counter to what the media believed to happen in the presidential elections. To the right, you have the um, 538 uh, projections towards the end. I think this was two days before the election, and sort of the representation of the swing vote. Specifically, if you look in the areas of darkest red, the two darkest red areas in the map on the left is the Appalachian region and the Rust Belt. So this shift did not match what the political expectations are. So we have to look at what role did journalism play in explaining the region to show these shifts? So to talk about uh, journalism, I'm going to use what my friend Ruth Deller talks about as an American legacy representation of journalism. In terms of my theoretical to make this a critical analysis, I'm using four points. That journalism is any type of content that uses a truthful, compelling narrative. If there is not a truth, it does not represent the, the communities in which they serve. And this compelling means that the people have to read these articles. Number two, that the news organizations represent the voice and record of a community. It is the record of source and the record of time that that community shows to the rest of the world. The third is talking about this in the ways, the stories that they write are written in a way that the audience should care about the story. This gets to a so what. Uh, for the first uh, two points, I use Goffman, I use frame analysis from the old school 74, and I use Schultz analysis of framing. Um, for the second, in terms of the record of the community, I use Goffman's dermatological theory, which talks about how communities, and specifically members of community, represent themselves. For the third, the, so, the, the care, the so what, I use agenda setting. The fourth one, which I think is more important, is that it follows the ethos and spirit of the practice of journalism. For this, I'm using Reese's narrative flattening model, which says that as stories move from communities to regions to national to international, the stories become more simplified as a way of getting the messages across to the given audience. So with this in mind, I focus on three research questions broken down to two different ways. What are the common themes of the stories of the Appalachian region as people? Um, what are the common themes about local, state, and national governments? And what are the common themes about the Appalachian people's view of national politicians and political parties? And I frame it in two different ways. I look at it as it was framed in the national organizations and in the Appalachian regional to see if these themes and discourses match. Because if they're not matching, this could be a reason why we have a difference of interpretation of what is happening in this region. To do this was a time-consuming process. So we started at the end of November during the election and it just finished the coding two weeks ago. And we used a mixed method interpretation. So we used the content analysis in the first part to look at the cases and all, the, all of the the possible stories to make sure that they were something that would fit in. We used a galaxy slash universe model. So this is not a sample pool. We looked at every possible story we could get our hands on. So I had four coders working with me to look at this process. After we started to code the, the stories, we used a case study which focused more on themes and discourses and narratives and allowed us to add the critical lens that we talked about in terms of the journalism. So to get to this process, we started with what Google and LexisNexis told us had 11,000 stories that referenced the Appalachian region in some way. From that initial galaxy, we cut it to 6,400, which were stories that were accessible. That means that stories we could actually look at, that we actually had a link for, we could actually read. The difference between these two, or the reason we went down this far, was one of them we just lost to link rot. The links were not there, they did not work. The second uh, connection is that, or the second point of separation is that they were under paywalls or they were under aspects that made them very difficult to access. Um, from the accessible news stories, we went to one that made up our sample pool. In this case, we looked for two different types of, of coverage. We looked at the, um, the news organizations that were coming from the Appalachian region and national coverage. And if I have time at the end, I can talk about how we determine those particular aspects. Um, from that point, we had about 2,500. And then the last part, which was significant to our research, we looked for stories that actually talked about the Appalachian region, at least a third of the story as a way of indicating some thematics. So with that in mind, I'm going to talk about the, what we discovered as part of our, 
research questions. So this is basically coming from our content analysis. To the left is our national coverage. For the, the themes about the Appalachian region, we started to see a lot of stories that were dealing with the forgotten people uh, narrative and the neglected metaphor. Uh, the numbers that you were looking at that are the frequencies of primary themes, these are the first themes that are mentioned. The eta squared is secondary and tertiary themes. So between the, the primary, secondary, and tertiary themes, we started to see about 10% of the time that the Appalachian uh, region the people were discussed, it was using this specific element. What became more evident during uh, natural disasters is sort of the hardy analysis that the people that are in this region are surviving through their own willpower and resourcefulness. That theme really piked up during the natural disaster, specifically June and November. In terms of the Appalachian regional coverage, the, f the focus was slice of life. They were showing the, the, the communities as they existed. And because of that, there wasn't really salient themes that occurred. It was basically a lot of of day-to-day -day activities, which this is going back to that uh, narrative flattening that I talked about earlier. In terms of governance, on the other hand, this is where we started to see some more salient themes. In terms of the national coverage, um, that there was continuing stories about the lack of support that the Appalachian region received from the national and state governments. And essentially, the local governments were were forced to give resources that were not ever so present in terms of the state or national budgeting. In terms of the Appalachian region, mostly we didn't, we, we talked, um, we looked at how the national government ignored the region. The only exception to this rule, which is important towards the end, is that the Appalachian Regional Commission, which is responsible for grants and responsible for maintaining the solidarity of the region, was ranked relatively high because of the grants and other resources that were provided by the commission. In terms of national, politi national politicians, um, that we started to see this flattening happening again, that eventually um, we started to see uh, Hillary Clinton, which was, um, she was represented uh, very simply as anti-coal, but at the same time had, should have had an edge with the women in the region. Um, now this is, this is interesting because it, it's different than the way that the Appalachian region framed it, that it was sort of a disconnection from the region and someone that supported NAFTA. Those, the, the idea of supporting NAFTA is a more complex way of understanding Hillary Clinton's perception in this region because it is more of a policy-driven as opposed to a rhetoric-driven style of communication. Donald Trump's, um, uh, um, the way that he was described in the course of the, the present, uh, the research was that it was at the national level was supporting coal jobs, at the, uh, at the Appalachian region it was really revitalizing the region. And in terms of the parties, the only thing I'll mention very briefly is that um, in the Appalachian region that the Republican parties were not mentioned in much detail. Essentially the Republican party was Donald Trump in the Appalachian regional aspects of this. So, in terms of the last two minutes that I have left, I want to talk about some themes that emerge outside of these questions. One that was a very popular thing that I had to denote that we're going to do more research down the road is how the national media and even the Appalachian regional media use hillbilly elegy as a, nas as a framing tool for this particular region. In terms of, if you're not familiar with the book, in the very brief, it is J.D. Vance's experiences of moving from Kentucky to Ohio and specifically looking at the cultural signifiers that were left in the wake in the changes of the political aspects. Um, when we looked at it in terms of the national coverage versus the regional coverage, the national coverage was using this as an explaining tool, that this was a way of understanding how Trump won these particular regions. But if you look at it from the Appalachian standpoint, it's basically looking at the cultural signifiers that were used in the book and sometimes we had counters. So basically, these were the counterpoints to the story. Um, the other thing that was mentioned briefly um, yesterday was the idea that we started to see a, the white working class as a narrative of this region, which is a, another example of the flattening, which eliminates the ideas of class and race. That's typically the region is diluted to one race and one class. This happened at more of a national level. In terms of a better representation of the region, um, I looked at West Virginia Public Broadcasting's Inside Appalachia because it tended to present a complex cultural tapestry of what was happening. So with the remaining time I've got left, so what?
What's happening in the current uh, political environment is with Trump's budget removing funding from the Appalachian Regional Commission. We're going to see how true these narratives hold. Specifically, if the funding is removed and we start to see some more action within the region, you'll see if these narratives hold or decline. So with that in mind, on the behalf of my coders, Aaron Swick, Ashley, Tom Craig, and Michael St. James, and Roscoe the Cat, I want to thank you for listening to me today. Does it work for you guys if I just hand you the microphone? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, so thank you to uh, all of our presenters. So uh, we've got uh, some good time for some Q and A. Uh, so if anyone has any questions uh, or feedback, I'd be happy to help facilitate that. And your questions will inevitably be smarter than mine, so <laughs> for everyone's sake, please don't make me ask a stupid question. <laughs> We have a question over here. Um, uh, I guess, I guess having heard each other's now, um, I guess how do you think of these? Are there? Is it is it dangerous to think of things universally, or are there are there, um, are there like yeah? Did you find that because you're all kind of like different regional kind of things? So Yeah, I think it's dangerous to think regionally because even, and I oversimplified mine because it really talks about one Appalachia, so to that end, I narratively flatten this. Um, if you do the research on Appalachia, there are about six or eight different Appalachians because even Pittsburgh is part of the Appalachian region. Lexington, Kentucky, which are these high density, um, uh, very, af in, um, there, there's, there are resources and money there. So, yes, I would say that in terms of the simplification, yeah, it's dangerous to think about universally, but you might find some generality patterns that you can use for other parts of the research. Uh, I, I guess, you know, my interest in sort of thinking about these broad, you know, concepts of, you know, of sort of refugees, forced migration, and precarity suggests, at least to me, that you want to think about how you can, you know, think respecting the differences and the, the particularities both of, of, you know, sort of region, time, and space, think about under what kinds of rubrics you could actually build and think about broader political alliances. Um, and, you know, because there obviously are sort of great divisions, you know, between people sort of in these various statuses. But, uh, I mean, precari precarity was originally actually, you know, sort of a European or probably a British Marxist concept to think about how you could think about class solidarity. And in fact, there's this kind of literature on the precariat. I'm a little skeptical that it actually works that well for refugees, but that's the provocation I wanted to start with anyway. All right, other questions? Yes. For Diana, do you think, you were talking about the kind of toxic class and race, uh, instructions that are exhibited in Latin America, do you think this attachment to American derails any a potential coalition of, between precarious individuals that are moving here? Attachment on behalf of who? But yeah. whose attachment? Mine? No, um, kind of the, the immigrant attachment to uh, social mobility as a soul. Right, yeah, definitely, because, I mean, if we want to talk about the universalizing of a narrative and how it's sold, especially via media, where there's sort of a hard-headedness and a lack of specificity that allows to, like, expand what exactly Americanity is like um, there's so much at play not just I need to make money so I come to the US there's really no understanding of visa stuff of what of who's a refugee and what exactly is going on in ev in like countries that where people are coming from you know so to still frame it as this sort of like I'm going to the US because the US is where I can live the American dream still um, that linear sort of narrative 
that continues to be perpetuated as an like a like Latin America, the U.S. is a very is a better version of an America, you know. So there's I do see an attachment to an Americanity as a very flat thing without getting into specifics. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? You can start. <laughs> Okay, who's next? So, in terms of what you saw in, in, in the communities, did you see the branding sort of, I feel like there's some preferreds on the natural sense of communities where we had these murals? Do you think that that was a, a fair representation that existed within those communities, or do you see that was an amplification, a simplification? How do you see the branding related to the communities? Um. How to start to answer that? Um, so right. So, so I went in there basically having been drawn into the brand quite quickly, um, and so the the twenty months of ethnography were sort of um, the project was deconstructing and unraveling that brand and trying to figure out what is actually going on in this neighborhood. Like, it, does the brand actually represent um, you know a neighborhood that is um, pulling itself out of precarity basically um, and there were some elements of that obviously a neighborhood that's sort of banding together um, and using the internet to their advantage um, and so what I tried to show here was that um, even though the brand is kind of showing to the nation that look uh, we're a community of Javanese regular people living in an urban neighborhood look what we've done on our own without government support without anybody's help um, we can do this on our own and we're using the internet um, to, I guess, economically and socially improve ourselves. And so what I saw actually is that yes, a few families are using um, the internet for online business opportunities, which is what they're really sort of emphasizing, um, but it, it goes beyond that. Um, and so what, I was what I'm trying to do in the dissertation is to show how um, the internet is important, not so much necessarily for its content, um, even though that's an important aspect, uh, it's not important necessarily so much for online business generation, but for um, it's important for how it um, it connects local people to this broader narrative and to this broader structure that's changing in Indonesia, which I didn't have a time have time to talk to about in my in my presentation. So. Um, you know, the country has been decentralizing for the last decade, uh, and so people are no longer relying on sort of top-down kind of um, corrupt net networks or, or patronism necessarily um, to g gain access to resources. They're sort of redefining themselves um, ethnically and culturally to sort of stand out in this new kind of neoliberal economy where, okay, you're not necessarily relying on father development um, to you know, to gain access to, to resources, you're you're banding together and you're kind of doing stuff on your own. And so there's this ki new kind of subjectivity that's emerging in Indonesia. And I think these internet kampung are just one manifestation of that. I don't know if that answers your yeah, question. <laughs> so I guess. Um, Maybe like one question I could pose then to sort of sort of bring this up to an elevation of uh, the level of the name of the panel, right? So home screens. Um, so I guess one question that, that I'll just pose broadly is I I wonder if like going forward, if we think about like certain technological affordances and the the nature of like infrastructure being so important, uh, is screens um, really a sort of primary locus of where we can help to understand some of these things? Should we shift the lens to places other than screens? Um, looks like you have some thoughts. Yeah. The, the one thing I didn't have a chance to talk about is the reason I'm interested in Appalachia is because I grew up there. That I lived in Zanesville, Ohio, which is in Appalachia, and I lived there for 30 years. I moved to um, Lancaster, Ohio, which was, uh, I was there for three or four years. I was in Lexington, Kentucky for a year. Um, the idea of screen is important because it's, it's a way of framing. So it is a, much like I was talking about in terms of the narrative flattening, it is a flattening. So it's something that I see as a representation, but not a complex representation. 
Um, down the road, as technology changes and form factors change, it depends on how you see your relationship between yourself and the community. So while I don't have the, the refugee understanding of the world, and nor do I have the understanding of, of traveling from one country to another, the difference of the regions become interesting because it's something that you use as a point of, of, of exploring your relationship to those communities. And I guess when I think of you know sort of of screens in this sense, I'm sort of thinking of you know what's going in and sort of you know what's going out. Um, and the anecdote that I you know that I sort of didn't get to tell um, was of you know, one of the an ethnography of the uh, or actually more of a some combination of a focus group and an ethnography of a Syrian refugee camp, in which. Um, you know, one of the refugees was just very adamant about picking up their screen and, and showing what had happened, you know, one of the massacres that, that had taken place. So to them, it was a way of sort of embodying and justify, you know, embodying their experience, justifying their flight, and trying to get their accounts out in, into the world. Um, so it was very much their voice, their persona, um, you know, their being and their story. Um, so in terms of you know figuring out what to what to research or what to really focus on, um, I think a, a good researcher kind of has to follow their nose and follow what's interesting in the data and in the, in the material that you're gathering. So when I went to Indonesia, I thought to myself, okay. The plan is I'm going to spend pretty much half of my time just talking to people and being in the neighborhood and then the other half um, gathering information from the internet, taking print screens, which I took hundreds of. Uh, and then I sat down, you know, in 2014 I started writing this dissertation and I kept getting stuck every time I picked up these screenshots. What am I going to do with them? How do I analyze them? I kept getting drawn to the story of the neighborhood itself and like what the internet means from you know a symbolic perspective or an, uh, you know the perspective of the poetics of infrastructure rather than the content itself. Uh, if I was to go do an ethnography somewhere else or if I was to do an ethnography like um, you know Tom Belsdorf did, and that just involves you know, sitting and being an avatar in a second life, then the home screen would obviously be the main focus of inquiry. So, um, so yeah, so that's my approach as an anthropologist is to really follow my nose. Did you? Um, I guess the two things that come into play f as far as home screens for me, since my particular situation is related to one of what I consume via my own screen and then as a possibility of the the opposite of flattening sort of like the presenting of a complexity of a relationship between both a screen becomes an opportunity if we look at it through like there's opportunity in media should anybody grant you the opportunity of like presenting more complex narratives which less than uh, I don't trust it with the more time passes, the less I trust it, but there's a possibility there that I just don't know what it looks like, you know, to present a more complex picture of what things look like. Um, th like you proved in your paper with Appalachia, um, that just, there's a flattening. Once it goes big, there's a flattening. So how, how do we stop that? I don't know. Via a screen or anything else, really. So And for myself, I don't know yet what I, what I get from a screen, and that's what I'm trying to figure out. But going to that point, how the narrative becomes more complex is the voices of the community rise within the presentation. And that's tricky because if you look at screens where the media control is coming from a national level, the intent is to simplify, to make the story as as reasonably understood. The finding does not mean that they're incorrect, but it's just a two simplification. So I... I I don't know. That's 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 the only thing that gives me a little bit of comfort in that regard is the voice of the community. We've got uh, almost ten minutes, so definitely time for a couple questions, comments, or feedback. Yes. 
theoretical book lenses in the last talk, and I'm just curious like, how much you think it is important, just the fact that people are talking about things, whether it's sort of mobile phones with uh, refugees, or it's just private Appalachia in general, or internet villages, or other things, and just how much you think there's sort of an interplay between the fact that people are sort of talking about those things and then the general public's perception of them in cases. Um, I mean, one of the things that, that really struck me um, as, as I was actually thinking about this talk is just, you know, what what do you know screens on phones mean? Um, and I mean, there was really, you know, I mean, for you know, at least you know, a month, which I guess is a lifetime, and you know, in, in newspapers, you know, this discussion of the fact that literally these cell phones meant that these people were not legitimate refugees. And then I started thinking back about this discussion of Obama phones. People familiar with that? Uh, there was this idea that, you know, uh, even though it was actually originally in a Reagan policy, that somehow Obama's handing out, you know, a you know, policy that sort of became more cell phone generated, that, you know, basically gave people certain income levels uh, access to a free phone, drove the right wing media absolutely crazy, for, again, for actually for, for a longer period of time. So the question becomes, you know, then. What is the nature of this kind of status object? What is the misperception, if you will, of this kind of screen, which is what I think requires people being able to and sort of willing to tell their own stories? Let me just end on one note, which is actually publicly available and very interesting, and that is that there was a filmmaker who actually gave cell phones or gave cameras to a number of refugees and basically had them shoot their own journeys as they came north. It was quite an interesting story. Going back to the question of the idea is talk. Um, I, going sort of to my theoretical framing, it's, it's good if it represents the, the reality of what is happening. If the talk is to add to the trivial, if the talk is just something that adds content to feeds, where it doesn't add to a discussion, I, I, I don't know if it's necessarily good or bad, but anything that represents truth within and verifiable truth within a particular topic helps the community, whatever that is, understand the subject. So I think yes with a with a big asterisk there. Probably one that's about 144 point font. In the back. It seems like in a lot of like the use of phones, like we see a lot of different sorts of money narratives going around about certain places and certain experiences. You know, so for example, if we talk about the refugees as precarity, but also there's also a narrative of, of like resilience, right? Of like fighting through and, and surviving in really dire situations. But one thing I'm interested to know about is with people having phones with them all the time, is like people who are often spoken about have access to those same narratives. And so I'm wondering if you could you have anything to, like what do people say about those narratives and how do they use those narratives and like for their own agency and their own life? What do they think about this flattening? What do they think about this idea that they have cell phones? They're not refugees. To me, you know, the, the interesting part of that is that they get used for all sorts of purposes. I mean, I just mentioned a few. Um, they also become ways of people, you know, recording the abuses that go on as they deal with smugglers. Um, and there's a lot of interesting sort of, you know, good film about this. But the, the, you know, the real challenge, again, sort of thinking about this not as a personal representation but as a, as a political representation is that the justification for being a refugee is that you know you have a well-founded fear that something bad is going to happen to you if, if you go back um, and so and you know, you're basically appealing to a kind of a humanitarian impulse a good samaritan impulse uh, as it were and I, I sort of see a certain kind of contradiction between the kind of agency that people like to portray and is you know, obviously very justifiable for people who, who survive these horrendous journeys and the fact that that you know, dimension gets pushed too far then people, again, in the same way that they look at the cell phones as suspicious, it sort of undermines the, the fundamental claim. Um, 
And again, I mean, there's always a kind of trickiness in any kind of political representation on this. I mean, I, I sort of briefly mentioned Marx's, you know, concept of, of radical chains, which is this idea that a class whose sort of, you know, both oppression and possibilities for liberation um, are fundamental to the, you know, sort of the overall system. But you have both of these concerns always going on. I just think the refugee version of it is a particularly tricky one to which I don't have an answer. I'm not sure that I fully grasp the, uh, the the whole question, but I mean, I'm just going to latch onto this idea of narratives, I guess. Um, you know, from from what I can tell, in these kinds of neighborhoods, is that there's a latching on to narratives that are coming from all over the nation, like from the top down, from the bottom up, that say, okay. Um, what does it mean to be a successful subject or a, a successful citizen in this country today compared to other periods of time? Um, and if those narratives are saying, okay, you know, having access to a cell phone or having access to a laptop is really the key to kind of leapfrogging over industrialization, to leapfrogging over, um, you know, the service econ economy in order to become an information economy. Um, how do we do that? Um, and so latching onto this idea that there are two things that need to happen. You need to sort of maintain your identity as a local person as, for example, as a Javanese person or as, um, you know, somebody from another region maintaining those values so that you're not corrupted and turned into a uh, westernized, egotistical, individualist, um, just like, you know, the stereotypes that you have from uh, from North America and Europe. Um, so latching on to this, uh, this, this local identity at the same time as you absorb um, this ideal of, of modernity, which is associated with technology and linear development from, you know, um, sort of this primit primitive, um, <laughs> you know, uh, to, to modern. Um, and so that's what we were seeing in these kinds of developments, which I don't think are, are limited to, to internet kampung. I think they're, they're happening in other kinds of neighborhoods as well. Um, so being an independent citizen that um, is self-reliant uh, in the sense of relying on your, your your neighbors and your kin members rather than uh, appealing to the government or um, or other entities for support. Uh, and so you see this reproduction of those narratives in these kinds of murals and in these kinds of representations that you find at the local level. I'll just, um, I'll address that I talk about particular technology as like my own personal relationship and like I, I mentioned it at the beginning that um, I could have I could have been more distant and been like, "This is what is shared via this technology, and is it an awful?" But at the same time, um, there it could be talked about in a way where it's like somebody that doesn't come from my background, my um, yeah, my background could propose a different version of like, this is what I received via WhatsApp and that's what is valuable. There's so many things that you can do via WhatsApp that includes voice notes and um, pictures, videos that people use very creatively. So like my own my own framing of what I get and what it represents to me at large is is very specific, but I, I mean, it, it just has allowed me to view things a bit more widely than I think I was allowed to initially. Uh, it is 1.15 exactly, uh, so that was a great uh, point to end on. Um, but thank you so much for coming out. Thanks to all of our presenters who did uh, an excellent job. And if you do have further questions, I encourage you to uh, come up and talk to anyone uh, now the panel's adjourned.